Welcome to Questions We're Afraid to Ask. All right, there we go. All right, so this is our first attempt at a podcast. We have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> we're going to try and figure it out. I'm my, sure we're going to delete this in probably. like a year. My name is Bill. And I'm Daniel. And uh, we both work at the same big tech company, uh, which will remain unnamed just for privacy reasons for the company. Um, and just a disclaimer, we won't talk a lot about tech stuff because, well, we had to sign an NDA working for a tech company and we can't really talk about tech stuff um, other than just general, very broad strokes. So throw that in there. Um, so a little bit, let's, let's talk a little bit about ourselves. And this is going to be kind of a interview podcast, ideally, is what we want to try and do. We want to try and ask questions. Um, questions that we're afraid to ask for a variety of reasons, because we don't want to sound stupid, because we feel ignorant. Questions that we may think are socially awkward. Some people don't like when you ask questions about things. Yeah, th some things may be triggering for some people, but we're coming at this because we don't know everything, and we don't know what we don't know. We say that all the time at work and in life. We don't know what we don't know. So when we don't know, we want to ask. So there's a variety of people that we'd like to eventually talk to. Um, but since this is a question and answer type podcast, uh, we're going to practice on each other. So Daniel, tell me, where where do you come from? Uh, what about yourself? I mean, I grew up in Houston. I spent every, all, until I graduated from high school, I lived in Houston. Um, went to, did private school all through school. Now, is this a secular private school or a religious No, private it's school? religious private school. It's, let's see, it was, I forget the first one, Baptist, Episcopalian, and Catholic. So I, I, I did the run on Christian denominations there. Yeah, that's so, so and, and it, did any of those align with your personal faith background growing up, or did you have one? Surprisingly, uh, so I, uh, the, I was in the Baptist school the longest. That was my, my elementary and middle school. Surprisingly, they were very secular in the way that they taught religion at that school. I'm sure that the church services were probably different, but like in the school side of things, they were very even-handed in sort of the... So it was very much like more history of religion and okay. you know learning Bible stories than it was... Here's what you're supposed to do, you know, kind of it's, thing. It's these are things that happened, as opposed to this is what you should believe. Yes, there was very little happened. belief and more of it, 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 approaching story. Like, you know, this is the story of Noah, and okay. it wasn't like, and here's all the other pieces to it. It's just this is the story, and this is what it meant, you know, okay. sort of thing. And so, private schools are generally a rather affluent thing. Um, yes. Uh, so two, two parts. The other part of that is, uh, did you do church religion stuff outside of going to school? Mm -hmm. And, uh, if so, did that match any of the schools that you went to? Like what no. denomination? Did so you I grew up in the disciples of Christ denomination, which people know as the school that that's the TCU is disciples of Christ. Okay. Uh, in Texas. So. Uh, that's what I grew up in. Uh, my grandfather was a disciples minister. Okay. So my mom grew up in that. Um, and that was, and I mean, I, at, at one point when I was in, I guess it was probably like late middle school, high school, when I decided it was time to go back to church because we had stopped for a while. We actually ended up going to the church that my grandfather used to preach at. Okay. Which was fun when you go in and everyone goes, oh, I know everything about you. Oh, yes. You know. Yes. I, I am slightly aware of some of some yes. of that, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, uh, but no, it did not line up with the schools that I went to. That's interesting. So you kind of got the, the whole religious blender. Um, yeah. Oh, and so we went to we went to a church up until, oh boy, I really don't remember. It was probably second, third, third grade, somewhere around there. And then, for reasons that I don't fully understand, we stopped going to church. Um, yeah, that, that happens, happens to a lot of people, yeah. And then when I when I hit sort of freshman year of high school, I think it was the summer before my freshman year of high school, like I went to my parents and was like, mm, it's time to go back to church now. 
Okay. Like, I need to go back. You, you felt some kind of draw. Yeah, or and so I immediately went back to church, stepped into a youth group, and went on a youth trip with the youth people I'd met two days before. Oh, wow. Like, it was it was a immediate, like, dip right back into that, that okay. thing. So. And uh, so were your parents loaded? Is that how you got to go to the big <laughs> private school in Houston? Because those aren't cheap. No, they're not. Well, so my mom taught at the private schools I went uh-huh. to, so half off there. Okay. Um, I honestly don't know how much money my parents made. Um, that was not something that they ever had any discussions with me about. I never heard, you know, budget conversations. I was, okay. I'm very naive to that, which shows in the way that I handle money as an adult. And ah. so I'm trying to fix that with my kids. Okay. Um, but, uh, my dad was a graphic designer for a, um, he worked in, for companies that worked with NASA. So like he did lots of interesting stuff in sort of graphic design of like making posters and making presentation. Like someone would come and go, we need to, we need this on a board for a presentation we're doing. So almost kind of like internal marketing for aerospace. Essentially. Yeah. That sort of stuff. It, 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 it exposed him to a lot of things, exposed me to a lot of really cool things at NASA that I wouldn't have been exposed to. But, you know, I don't think he was making bank, you know, because we did, we grew up in a, I grew up in the in the Heights in Houston, which now is it's million nice dollar area. houses. Yes. When I grew up there, it was. We used to avoid the Heights. <laughs> yeah, we had we had you know apartments behind us that were falling down, da- falling apart, and you know, I remember the night that the someone broke into a house and crawled under our house, and the police had to sick the dogs yeah. under the house to get. Like, yeah. I mean, it wasn't the greatest place but i grew up outside of houston and my family's from houston for the most part or and my parents are from the houston area and yeah i remember growing up it's like we're not going to the heights that's not the nicest part of town so now now, it's amazing i mean my my parents spent i think they they told me they spent like 30 grand on their house in Mm -hmm. you know in the 70s or whatever and i think the last time i talked to them they were like oh it's like three quarters of a million and that's just the piece of property the house isn't worth anything yeah it's it's the lot the, the lot, lot is worth yeah. a fortune because it is where it is. Right. Cool. So that got you through high school. What'd you do after that? <sighs> Nothing. Uh, <laughs> Fair I, enough. I had I I I tried to go to school. Um, I did five years in high school. I I was I'm not a good. I had a hard time in school. I have ADD. I have learning challenges. It was just not. And I also don't care. Like, well, and. Didn't you just recently find out that there is something about you you didn't know growing up? Uh, yes, the thing that I'm, we're going to be asking every interviewer person that we talk to. Yes. Uh, I discovered that I have something called aphantasia, um, which is it's a new thing. Like I think it's only within the last 10 years that they've really started to name it. Apparently there was one guy who mentioned it like back in the 70s in some book was like, mm-hmm. and then some people don't see things in their mind. And then no one ever talked about it again until like the mid 2000s or something. But now it's being explored. And now it's being explored apparently somewhere between, they estimate between like 5 and 12% of the population has little to no visual uh, memory or imagination whatsoever. So I think as you and I have talked about this You've asked me things, and I will say, you, for example, the movie Fantasia, yes. right, uh, which is a, a wonderful Disney movie. Um, I can close my eyes and run the entire movie in my head as if I'm watching it on the screen right now. I see it. I can see Mickey. I see. I can see the dancing brooms. I can see all that. The water splashing up. It's all happening in my brain. Yeah, I see the room that we're in, and I see you, yes. and I see nothing else. And if I walk out of the room, you don't even there, remember my face. No, I cannot recall. I mean... It's it's a strange thing to try to explain. I can remember what you look like, mm-hmm. and I can try to recall features, but I can't see it. And so, like, I remember growing up, and it, and like everybody knows the like we're gonna meditate. Yes. So close your eyes and visualize a beach. I assumed that was a metaphor. Ah. Because I can't see a beach, and I just assumed no one else could either, and I never quite understood why visualization was such an important thing, because we don't visualize things. But you don't visualize right. things. This is, so, cause, so I, as we've talked about this, because you know, Daniel and I are buddies, and we've talked for a while, uh, it almost to me sounds like you're, you're coming up with a written summary when someone asks you to visualize. Yes. Like, if it's a beach. Okay, it's got water, it's got sand, it's got crabs, it's got other sea life, it's got 
you know people and umbrellas, people, umbrellas and there's there's i mean i can i can just off a list of things you're not seeing that in your brain i can describe the galveston beach from the last time i was there i can tell you what was there i can yeah. tell you there was a you know there was a family over there we were trying to take pictures with our friends they were Oh, they were having a family thing. We were, my wife was taking pictures because she's good at that. There was another family over there. They were doing. I, mean, I could tell you about them, but I can't describe them to you. Fair enough. It's it's strange. And and it's still being explored, mm-hmm. right? So, I it, it's the I'll give you the the biggest thing that that got that was the fix for me was my wife understanding that when she when she was asking me to remember a piece of clothing that she'd shown me the day before that I wasn't I wasn't trying to be difficult it wasn't that I didn't remember it was that I honestly cannot recall it but if she could explain it to me enough I could remember what oh it was the blue thing with the gold trim and the fr- oh yeah I remember what you're talking about now but just the the, aha the moment. blue thing I wore yesterday is not enough information for me to remember what you're talking about, because I, I can't see it. Yeah, that's that's fascinating because it's it's not something that I have ever dealt with, and uh, I've dealt with different challenges in my, you know, life and family and, and stuff, which which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so we've got you up to. So there were some learning challenges. Yeah. So I I did I did five years of high school because I went I did a my freshman year and then my half of my sophomore year at the Catholic high school. Mm-hmm. It was college prep. It was high expectations. It was way more than I was able to deal with. Okay. And so I got moved over to a Montessori Episcopalian school, okay. which was starting its high school. Uh-huh. And they only had a freshman class. So, they, was their, so I went back a, sem- you know, a, year, a year, did the second half of my freshman year, and then went through and finished with my ex- exceedingly huge graduating class of four people. Oh, my gosh. So I was fourth in my class, <laughs> uh, but it's not good when you're last in your class as well. Yeah, you're bot- your bottom um, quarter percentile there, you know. Uh, but, yeah, you I know. mean, I, 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 it is fair that but number you came one, in fourth, everything you did. But number one is a PhD now, yeah. so you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's it's like we like to say at work a lot. It's not a statistically relevant number. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and and I will I will honestly say like my grades weren't great mm-hmm. i did pass everything i mean Hell i got yeah. b's and c's i was but i just you're an average student i didn't care enough to put in the effort no passion behind it that i yeah I, something that i've there's a there's a tiktoker who talks about add a lot and he talks about that add people chase the dopamine okay which is why like i got into genealogy a few years ago and i was just super passionate about it for two years and then i was like and then the dopamine ran out and now you and I don't really care anymore. Yeah. Well, actually, what happened was someone asked me to do something for them. It turned into a commitment, which made it not fun anymore. Yeah. And then I couldn't do it. Yeah. So you know, that, again, that's my brain being dumb. Um, so I tried to go to. I, I went to TCU for a semester, but I didn't want to go. I before I left, I went to my parents and said. I need a break. I just did five years of high school, which was awful and terrible, and I hated it, and I don't want to go to school right now. And they said, well, you go to school after you finish high school. And so I I went. And then I didn't go to class because there was no one there to hold me accountable. Oh, yeah? And I had had no personal accountability at that point because I hadn't needed it because it had all been given to me. All the accountability was given to me. And so I... Did nothing. I, I partied for a semester. I needed it. I really did. You needed the break. I needed a break. And okay. so I didn't go back for the second semester, obviously, because I didn't go to any classes. Um, I did, however, pass my computer science final. I didn't go to a single class, and I went back, and I took the final and passed it anyway. That's funny. Which was fun. Just I did it. It was honestly, at that point, it was just to prove to myself that I knew that stuff well enough. Like, I knew I wasn't going to come back. I knew yeah. that I walked in the room, and the teacher was like, why are you here? And I was like, because I'm going to pass this, you know. <laughs> um, but I left, and I, so I came back to Houston. I was living with my parents for a little bit. They told me to get a job. I went and worked at a – I found a – there was a, a religious bookstore in Houston. There's a lot of them, but yeah. yeah so I, I don't, I don't want to nick call anybody out. So, Fair but enough. I went and worked yeah. there for six months. It was okay. It was a bookstore job. Retail. It was retail. The ladies there were were very 
protective of their jobs and like to mess up the work that I did. And, and it was one of those situations. So I left that job. I went and worked at a comic book store in Houston for a few for six months. Uh, and then my parents told me to, I needed to leave. So I went to Dallas to go stay with my aunt. I st was there for six months, worked at a grocery store, did photo lab stuff. It was interesting. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then a friend of mine works, worked at the time, the doctor, Okay. Worked at the time as a secretary at the tech company that okay. we now work for, and said, "Hey, there's a, they're hiring for um, uh, contract workers, so like through a through a hiring Third company." Party. Yeah, and she said, "Call this person." Called that person, uh, got an interview. Um, the interview was the greatest interview I ever had. They did like a group interview where they just like talked to a whole bunch of people, and then they put us all into computer labs and gave us this big. 20 page packet of like open a document and type a thing and save a thing and yes. do a thing and then when you're done come and ask us for a disc and you can burn the disc and you'll be done well i got up in like five minutes seven minutes and said i need the disc and the proctor was like sorry what I was like, oh i'm done oh you can go talk to the higher person outside don't yeah. even worry about burning the disc if you're like if you're yeah. done we want to hire you and so i got a job um doing phone tech support Mm -hmm. Did that for a long time, 10 years. Uh, and now I do training. I teach people how to do phone calls. Okay, cool. Yeah. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And outside of work, uh, you're married? I'm married. I have two kids, um, 11 and 9, so middle school, mm -hmm. about to be middle school for the younger one. Um, Your wife overschedules you? My wife, over. well, we overschedule <laughs> ourselves, let's be fair. <laughs> Uh, we do overschedule ourselves. We I, do a lot of, but we do a lot of stuff. I mean, we we really try to. Y'all are busy. We, Seriously, you keep busy. We do, but we also sort of our big thing is experiences for the kids. Well, and your kids are also at a busy age because yes, um, I'll get into my kids later, but they're very far apart in age where yours are much closer. Much closer, yes. And uh, there's a parenting phase of life where you almost become like a professional chauffeur. And you're you're very into that right now. We do. We've got lacrosse and soccer. Yeah, are the two that we play. My son's been playing lacrosse since he was in kindergarten. That's wow. seven years of lacrosse at this point. Was that right? No, eight. Eight years. Eight years. Because he he got to go through kindergarten twice. Oh, okay. We decided it was there was a moment when they were like, we think he should do kindergarten again. I was like, let's do kindergarten and not freshman year. Yes. Like let's let's skip him now. Much better and not than freshman year, because I I actually got held. I didn't. How did that work? They were gonna move me. I was in like, I was gonna get moved up or moved back, and they decided to keep me up. And they they should have held me back in they like second have. grade. Yeah. And I you know so that's yeah. why I was like kindergarten now. Do it now. Be done. Do it now. My youngest also uh, repeated kindergarten, but for a, ver a very different. <laughs> set of reasons what uh, reason was that uh it was a it was a actually it was a whole bunch of stuff um money was a big one because he didn't do any preschool uh mm. because i was in the middle of a very long divorce and custody battle which ate up a ton of resources um and covid <laughs> which we're not going to get into on this one we're not going to get we'll into but I, I, all i will say is he didn't get out of kindergarten the first year between the hybrid the number of days they gave them off, uh, how many days they let them out early. He missed a lot of the stand in line, you know, keep your hands to yourself, all that stuff you normally get in preschool. He didn't get, yeah. at least not well enough. So he repeated kindergarten, did much better the second time through. I mean, we we saw that now from with my kid, mm -hmm. my older one, who was just like, I didn't learn the math I needed to learn mm -hmm. when we were at home doing virtual yeah. And so he's been doing, you know, tutorials with his teacher to, to fill in that gap. But I think I think taking a sidebar on that, I think a lot of kids missed a lot of stuff in that in that two and a half that year and a half, two year period. I, I completely agree. And this is something I am not an expert in and cannot speak to. But I have heard people talk about we have now, you know, uh, referring to them almost as a lost generation or people who are now like five years behind and I don't understand how two years equals five years, but I'm not an expert, but yeah. it does appear that it significantly impact everybody's learning Well, because I, we I, weren't ready for it. I do remember when, so my, uh, uh, my mom is an educator. She's also 
a, a diagnostician. She mm-hmm. she went to school and got all those things so she could give people IQ the, tests the and test, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And yeah. and like you know if you have autism and 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 all the, she does a lot of that sort of testing stuff. Um, but I remember I'm trying to remember where I was going with this now. Oh, that that there's a lot of information that's lost just over the summer in the three Absolutely. month break that the kids have. It sets them back, you know, six months or whatever. So if you took that six month that three month break and turn it into a year and a half. Yeah. Maybe it does set you back five years. Yeah, because I, I know that they have talked about, you know, year-round school and things like mm-hmm. that. And my actually, my younger brother got to experience um, the year, year-round school for about two or three years. Do you like it? Um, we all hated it. Um, only because they did it in elementary and junior high, but not high school in the district that we were in. Mm. So it didn't match. So my brother would be off a month when everybody else was working. And then summer would roll around and my mother worked for the school district. And so she would be off and I would be off and my brother's in school. Right. And so, you know, maybe it would have worked if everybody did it. But this is Texas. I also grew up in Houston and football is king and football is God. And there is no way we're going to mess with high school football and do this year round stuff. We, that, that just ain't going to happen, much less the rest of the sports. So um, it was an experiment. They did it for a few years and then they stopped. Um, yeah, I, I think there I mean, and we can get into this in a whole other conversation, but you and I both think there are some some potential massive reforms that could be implemented in the education system. I'm kind of ready to burn everything to the ground and start it over. Oh, again. yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll get into our theory about how when you run for president at the end of it, they should just shoot you. And then, <laughs> you know, that's a whole that's a whole other. So that's OK. Just so anybody's <laughs> listening, that's a thing. That's not my theory. That's Daniel's <laughs> theory, and he's not talking about assassinating presidents. No, no, it's a Just voluntary. It's, it's a, a voluntary, voluntary service. Thing, and when you're done, you run for a lot longer. And when you're done, you just check out. You just check out so that you don't have to owe anybody anything. That's that's really yeah. what it is. We may talk about that. I don't know. I don't really want to talk to the Secret Service. So uh, <laughs> I'm not. I am in no way encouraging anyone to cause. Any sort of harm to anyone, this would be a self-checkout situation. And, and, and we're, we're also talking about crazy political reform, if you yes. wave a magic wand. We're Absolutely. not talking about anything else. So, just want to be clear about that. Uh, You're too paranoid. No one's going to listen to this. I don't think No one's ever going to listen yeah. to this, except, you know, the NSA flags everything ever put out. <laughs> I am not a conspiracy theorist. Too many things have come true. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am um, more of a conspiracy conspiracy theorist now, and that's growing up with a dad with a file cabinet full of UFO materials, which is fascinating. We'll get into and all that stuff that. a little bit more. But I I more things have come true recently. Well, that's what I meant. I yes. mean, it's it. What is the meme? And and I'm I'm in no way, uh, shape or form, endorsing Alex Jones here. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, what is the meme that popped out a couple of years ago? Where are we on the Alex Jones' is right chart? You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and granted, he's got some set, he's made some major mistakes. Absolutely. He's also been right about some stuff. He has. He has. So there's, there's the it's, – well, it's Nostradamus. He's yeah. right about some, some stuff, stuff and he's, he's wrong, wrong about wrong some, some stuff. stuff. But the stuff he's and, right about is – And sometimes when you say something early on, in hindsight, it fits too. You know, there's yeah. that aspect of prophecy. Um, and if you just say, like, the government's corrupt and they're going to do something bad, at some point you're going to be right. Uh, Absolutely. But, you know, he has been right about some stuff. Well, and talking fair. about I, – I was just – I'm pulling this up it's now just so the I can UFO remember stuff. the name. Well, but I was just telling you about that, that YouTube video I watched yesterday by the guy, and his name is – I'm going to find this because I want to give him credit for it. His first Absolutely. name is Tom, and I cannot remember his last – Tom Scott. Tom Scott. So Tom – he's a huge Tom channel. Tom Scott YouTube channel. Go check out his channel. Everyone watches I, his channel. He's, I have never lo- watched his he's channel. He's amazing. So. I love Tom okay. Scott. But he he sort of did a video, his last uh, post from when we were recording this, was just sort of like looking at, at where AI is going and comparing it to where Napster and wondering like if the, the sigmoid curve that comes off of these two is like... How Napster became Spotify with a right. lot of stuff in between. So where is, where is, where where is, is AI? And where is he was the AI to, going and you and I have very different philosophies on AI. You you like it. You're interested in it. I want to burn it to the ground now before it can you know develop like thinking skills and destroy us. And I, I think that but has I grew a up lot. With Terminator. So I grew up with Terminator as well. That's also something we should point out. Um, you are much younger than me. Are you by gonna, five years. Are you going to call me that word again? 
Yeah. Am I going to have to stab you on the first podcast? So, uh, there are some people who define millennial I'm gonna punch you right as now. your generation. No. Um, we have found a different term. Oh, do you remember what it was called? Zennial. Zennial. I'm happy. I will take that one. Yeah, Zennial. Um, I came on the tail end of Gen X. In fact, I've had some people tell me I'm a Zennial, depending on how it's defined. But we're five years apart in age. Yeah. You know, I am a Star Wars baby. I was born about the time Star Wars came out. You were born about five years later. So you were born well, in the 80s. 80, I, I was born Return of the Jedi. Yeah. 80, May of 83. So you so caught the tail end. I caught the tail end of Star, Star Wars. Wars. I was born in May of 78. So There you go. Uh, we're almost exactly five years apart. But it's fascinating as we've talked, some of the differences that we've run into. You also, your parents didn't let you watch TV <laughs> growing up. We'll get into that. <laughs> Which we, 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 And the only reason I bring that up is... I was the TV was always on at my house, so it's a very different background. My, the TV was only on Saturday mornings for cartoons, and then like sometimes in the evening, like but only on the weekends, never during the week. Yeah. Again, my mom was a teacher; she had teacher theories on things. Absolutely, absolutely. And my my parents, we walked in, and the you know we turned on the lights and flicked on the TV, and it was just on whether we were watching it or not. So you said you grew up in Houston. Yes. So okay. So thank you for the thank you for the intro. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Houston, Texas, uh, H town, um, which. Now I grew up in downtown. You did not grow up in in Houston. I, where I, did you okay, live? Okay. So yes, where I grew up is now considered Houston proper. Yes. But when I was a kid, it was the boonies. Uh, I grew up in Cyprus, uh, specifically. The Sci Fair School District, which is uh, over by Jones Road and Highway 6 and uh, Highway 290 and Northwest Houston, uh, just outside of town. <clears throat> and growing up, we really didn't go inside the 610 loop. And for those who don't know, Houston has several loops around it. The 610 is kind of the famous one because it's the first one. Um, and we didn't go into the 610 loop unless there was a reason. If we were going to the rodeo, if we were going to something in the Astrodome or downtown for some kind of big event, <clears throat> we'd go into town. But we didn't need to. Houston is massive. And a lot of people don't realize it's one of the biggest cities in the United States and has been for a long time and just keeps getting bigger. Uh, but my neighborhood growing up, it was a little neighborhood. And then on the other side of the street... So where I grew up, there was the street, and it was the edge of the neighborhood, so there were houses across the street from me, and then behind those houses was a giant pasture with cows in it, and woods and, and stuff to go mess around and do. And then just past us, as you drove, if you were leaving Houston, um, if you got on I-10 and headed out, you'd run into all the rice paddies. Don't, a lot of people don't realize that one of the biggest cash crops along the Gulf Coast region is rice. You know, and it, it's know like that. watching a Vietnam movie. It's just rice patties after rice patty after rice patty. Is that still the case now? It was when I was growing up. Okay. Because we did a lot of trips to go visit my extended family. So I would spend the week in town and about every other weekend out of town and a large portion of the summer out of town. Um, in, uh, I had family in Luling who were ranchers. They had a small ranch. Let's pause and salute our hats to Luling. Barbecue. Absolutely. Okay. Luling City Market. I'm going to plug it. They are not sponsoring us. Please sponsor if you want to. Send us some sausage. Send us some sausage. <laughs> Luling City. Luling is famous for a few things. It's where oil was discovered. It's just up the road from where oil was discovered in Texas uh, initially. Um, it is where the stereotype comes of having an oil well in your backyard because a lot of the houses in Luling have the oil pumps, the, the ones that go up and down. Uh, in their backyard to the point where they decorate them. So they will look like Shamu the whale or their big giant butterflies. Uh, you can see it like um, Texas Monthly Magazine has done things on it. Uh, some of the other Texas magazines have done, done things on it. Or if you just were to Google Luling, Texas oil wells, you would find that they decorate their oil wells. It's the home of the Watermelon Thump, which is a great little festival. Uh, that's the, I believe it's the last weekend in June every year, so it's hot. Another thing it's famous for is the train runs right through downtown, and the festival is right next to the train tracks, so you can feel it run by when you go through. 
and because there are so many oil wells in town, it smells like sulfur. It's it's not uncommon for the town to smell like rotten eggs. And they have amazing barbecue. That New City so Market good. is just absolutely amazing. We're going to talk about barbecue a lot, and we're going to talk about... Now, this may be controversial. We're going to talk about the right kind of barbecue. And I'm not going to say what that is right now, because right now everybody in the South is going off about their type of barbecue. I will say this. I love all barbecue, but... Um, I mean, that's a stretch. You know, saucy barbecue, um, the Kansas City barbecue, the, the, the they all have their place. They do. They I'm, do. I'm now, not a much fan. much more of a cook than I am. Well, yes, I, I do cook, but I'm not much of a fan of the mustard-based sauces. On the right meat, it's great. I'm not saying it's not good. I just said not a fan Fair enough. of the mustard-based sauces. I've had some of the best Kansas City pork ribs that are mustard-based that I've ever had. They're amazing, but... I prefer... That's not where you lean. I, I honestly lean to as little sauce as possible on yeah, most you're, things. You're, you're more of a Texas style, just like a dry Except rub. Except ribs. Well, um, but that's my wife. My wife likes saucy, sweet ribs, yeah. and so that's what I make. So are you saying your wife is saucy? Absolutely. Sorry, we're not go there. <laughs> um, All right, so you're in Houston. Yeah, so I grew up on the edge of Houston, and I watched it... I watched Houston, the amoeba of Houston, the concrete amoeba, slowly absorb all of the farmland and by the time i left houston we were in the middle of town Mm -hmm. it was all concrete it was all strip center it was all big highways Uh, and so i watched it all grow grow up and grow out and for those who don't know houston houston's a swamp everybody thinks of texas texas is this desert with the with um, tumbleweeds blowing by and all that, and Texas is massively diverse. It's huge, right? You know, there are areas. With there are areas that look like the old cowboy shows, but Houston is not one of them. No, no. Houston has more in common with Louisiana than it does uh, geographically than it does with like that West Texas stereotype. Um, so to to make everything not sink, they just pour concrete everywhere. Yeah, and Houston is a giant concrete jungle, which is why. It Houston rains. floods so it bad. It floods. It rains almost every afternoon. Uh, almost, you could set your cl- set your watch to it. See, now I don't know if that's still the case. It may anymore. not be, but growing up, it was. But it was. I remember in you know in the in the high school, you know, in the summers, it yeah. didn't rain. But then you would know, like, come like October, November, it'd start raining almost every day, and then like yeah. early well, and, spring, and, and, and it in rain the spring, a lot. Yeah. Uh, it was it was like it would hit three o'clock every day. Mm-hmm. And it would rain for 10 minutes. And the sun would never go away. It would be sunny and raining. Boom, out of nowhere. So strange. I'm sure it's coming off the Gulf Coast. I'm sure it's coming off the Gulf Gulf Coast. It's the humidity and the heat and everything hitting the right temperature. Because it was not uncommon for both of us growing up. The the average heat in Austin, not Austin, uh, in Houston uh, would be 95 degrees. And Mm -hmm. the average humidity would also be 95 95 degrees. You know, we used to joke that you'd take a shower uh, and get cleaned up and walk out to the mailbox at the end of your driveway, and by the time you got it back in, you needed another shower. You were so sticky. Well, it was that you would shower and get dressed for school, and then the walk from the door to the car. Yeah, you were so You were sweating. Yeah. yeah. I also drove, when I was in high school in the Houston heat, I drove cars without air conditioning. Yeah, but you so had an awesome car. I without, did have an awesome we'll, car. We'll talk about that later. Uh, I miss my car. This is an amazing thing. Uh, <laughs> it is an amazing thing. It's a 1974 VW thing. So, yeah. yes, it yes. was amazing. I yeah. missed that car. It uh, was also the most unsafe thing I've ever driven in my entire life. But it looked cool, and it was orange. And the ladies really appreciated it. Except yes. my wife didn't like it. But I also drove like a maniac in that car. Yes, yes. Um, and we're not going to get into who made what car and what you support or any of that, even though that's been in the news lately. <laughs> Bill Maher did a really cool bit on that. My um, Kubel wagon is very fancy. Yes. Um, so I, I grew up in Houston, but I spent a lot of time in Luling working on my mother's parents' small ranch. Um, and Or we would go to visit my dad's side of the family, and it was my great-grandparents, because I was lucky enough to get to know know them. And they had a small piece of property. And they lived north of Austin in a little town called Harker Heights, which is right outside of Fort Hood, which is the largest military base in the U.S. Um, and so I was kind of like half city mouse, half country mouse. Um, so that's that's that 
takes me through like where I grew up. Um, I went to public school, stayed in the same school district. I grew up in the same house um, from the time I was born to the time I was 18. I never moved. Um, uh, I was all in the Sci Fair school district. Uh, although I did start high school at a brand new high school. Uh, I started at Sci Falls, which is a one, it's not new anymore, but it was brand new. And so I was part of the class that opened it up. And it started with freshman, sophomore, and then every year they'd add a grade until until they graduated. So I was the first full graduating class that had been. Did you have years. more than four people in your graduating class? I had almost eight hundred people in my graduating class. My high school. Were you the eight hundredth on your list, though? No, I was okay, not. Good. I was I was in the top quarter of my class. <laughs> um, but um, for a variety of different reasons, um, I read a lot. I love to read and I love to read everything. And, you know, I was also being pushed, go to college, go to college, go to college, um, because you had to go to college if you wanted to be successful. And lies. I didn't work my butt off for it, but I was smart enough. I was good at math and science. It was fun. I found it fun to the point I stayed engaged and I read enough that it, it offset my dyslexia and my dysgraphia um, that it let me, you know, pass the English stuff. I'm also passionate about history. So a lot of the subjects I found fun in the school. And so I did, I, you know, if I didn't do the work, I did enough of the work to, you know, I was an AB student, you know, um, for the most part, um, <clears throat> good enough to get into college. And then I went to college. So, uh, let's see. And then, uh, what did you do after college? Well, one other thing I want to point okay. out: I have a younger brother. I have one sibling. I you, have no siblings. You are an only child. Um, and my brother's three, th about three and a half years younger than me. I always like to say four because he's four years behind me in school because of where the birthdays fall. My brother's birthday fell like four days past the cutoff, so he was. Almost held like back. The even. oldest one of yeah, his grade. Yeah, he was always, always. the oldest one. Yeah. Like school would start, and three days later he'd have his birthday. Whereas I was on the opposite end. I was one of the youngest ones, and I almost wish my parents had held me back so I wasn't so much younger compared to everybody else. Because I turned eighteen, and then I graduated high school like three weeks later. So that's that's how it yeah. would have been for me if I hadn't been held back a but year. That's, that's yeah. a very different maturity level. Yes. And um, I, I think I benefited from being 18 my entire senior year. Absolutely. I think that was really good for me. Absolutely. And I think if that's one of the, if I could wave a magic wand, that's one of the things we would do is you would be 18 your whole senior year. Um, mm. if, if I could wave my magic wand to do that. Um, so uh, when I graduated high school, I. And, and during high school, I worked. My last two years of high school. Did you work during high school, or did you just? Go to uh, school? I worked over the summers. I did not work during. Well, and I, I take that back. I take that back. I did work my senior year. Uh, they had a, like we had one of those like work program things, and yeah. so I actually got a job at the school that my mom worked at doing, like all the IT grunt work that the IT people didn't want to do. So moving so, computers and plugging things in and networking and stuff like that. So my dad was an electrician and worked for the school district. And my mom, was for the first part of my life, she ran her own babysitting and daycare business uh, out of the house and only kept teacher's kids or people who worked for the school district so that she was off in the summer when we were off. That's smart. Yeah. Um, and before I was born, she had been a teacher's aide. And then she went back to work uh, after my brother and I were both in school full time. Uh, she went back to work as a teacher's aide, worked with um, special needs kids for a while, and then eventually moved into like the secretarial pool and worked as a principal secretary or assistant principal secretary for a long time. So both my parents worked for the school system. Um, they weren't teachers, but they both worked in that school system. <clears throat> but my dad was very much, you're going to work, you need to work. And so I started a mowing business when I was about 12. And when I say started a mowing business, my dad let me use his lawnmower. And, but he had standards because he had run his own successful mowing business for years until he lost it when everything fell apart under Carter. And he went from having a successful business to the business folded in like six weeks. Um, 
and we may talk you know we may talk about some of those times later on but for those who aren't aware this isn't the first time the economy sucked this isn't the first time that we've had like gas go through the roof this has happened before um and interest rates spiked i mean i think when my parents bought their house uh they were paying like 12 and a half percent or something like that and they also paid like thirty thousand dollars for their first house but ended up paying almost like 175 over 30 years and this is before you could pay early there were there were penalties if you did anything you had to pay the full interest you know all of that was very different but i had that work ethic early on maybe it was 14 it was 12 or 14 somewhere in that ballpark i started mowing yards and i didn't have a lot of them i'd have five six yards and mow them for about, about 20 bucks and I would mow with a lawnmower. I'd bag everything. Uh, before This was before mulching mowers were a, mm. a thing. But I'd bag everything up so it could get hauled off. Uh, I would edge with a gas-powered edger, not a weed whacker or weed eater. Um, I'd weed eat everything. Um, now, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Your gas-powered edger, was it a like push like a lawnmower with a thing that like you would lower down into the... Yes, it yeah, was a okay. three. It was a three-wheeled mm-hmm. edger with a giant spinning vertical blade. Yeah, it was a death machine. It was a death machine. I love them. They give the crispest they edges do. ever. My dad had one. I have an electric one now, and it's not as good mm-hmm. as that old gas. And we still have a couple of the old gas-powered ones that my dad has managed to keep running. The thing I loved about that one is that if you put it down and you like, I mean, boy, it would throw so many sparks. Oh if yeah, you touched the I mean, I mean it, it's. But that would put this the deepest. It's a nice, deep, line. clean line yeah. cut. Absolutely. Um, I didn't think I'd get this excited about a edger. But I know. Yeah. Um, and then I started with a, I started with an electric weed eater that I had to haul the extension cords around, and eventually we moved up to a gas-powered weed eater. Uh, but I did that for several years during the spring and the summer, and so that let me save up enough money that when I finally got a car, I could afford the car insurance, which was outrageous in Houston and still is. Uh, because Houston's inside one county, and, and that's one of the reasons the insurance rates are so high, or at least that's what I've been told. Um, and then I went to work at uh, one of the best sporting goods stores around, uh, Academy Sporting Goods. I'm going to plug them because, you know, we're not sponsored by anybody. Um, but I worked for Academy, um, and I got that job the summer between my junior and senior year. And so I stopped mowing yards, and I, I drove to Academy, and I opened the Woolabrook store, which doesn't exist anymore. There's a new one. Is that the one that was in the mall? No, it was the one that was across the street okay. from the mall. Uh, and it was one of the biggest ones at the time. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of sad now that that store is not there anymore. But, you know, say la vie. It is what it is. Um, and I did that <clears throat> all through high school. And then I went to college in a little town called Seguin at this massive university uh, called Texas Lutheran University, which used to be Texas Lutheran College. It used to be TLC. Now it's TLU. Um, Did they change that after the TLC TV it. station? Uh, no, they changed it like a year or two before I started. I don't remember why. Um, and, you know, a massive university that averages like 1,500 students. So total. Um, <laughs> uh, which So huge. Huge, huge university. And, and one of the reasons I did that is I went to a monstrous high school where I was just a number. And I wanted to go to college if I was going to go to college someplace I wasn't just a number and get a little bit more of that small feel. And it was close to my family, uh, or my extended family. My aunt lived in Gonzales, which is uh, east of uh, Seguin, which is where Texas Lutheran is. And my grandparents lived in Luling, which was also just uh, about 10 minutes up the road. Uh, And it's just outside of San Antonio. It's just east of San Antonio. And we have an interesting connection there in that I actually went to college with your wife, but she and I didn't really know each other, yeah, even I think though you, she and I have the same friends. She would have been a freshman the year that Girl, you were a senior. senior. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, that was an interesting evening where I was called my wife to go, I'm sitting at a table with other people that you're going to know who they are. Yeah, well, it, and it was it was really interesting because we were playing our favorite one of our favorite role play, tabletop role-playing games because um, we're nerds, and we do that. And long live the nerd. This is the age of the geek. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we have a connection there and it's funny. We're sitting here recording this and I'm staring at a TLU bulldog there truck is. right now. There is right there. <clears throat> which is just kind of funny. Um, and, uh, I started pre-med because everybody had told me, you know, you're smart, you're good at science, you're good at math, you should be a doctor. They make a lot of money. And I have absolutely, I still don't know what I want to do for a living, right? I have no idea. I've never, I've never had that ambition. 
right? Some people are like, I want to be this. I never really had that. Yeah, right? same here. Um, and, until I got to college. And then I found something that was fascinating at college, and I, I was pre-med for the first year. But Texas Lutheran is a religious school. You know, it's in the name. It's a Lutheran school. Uh, ELCA Lutheran, and we'll talk about the different flavors later on. Um, uh, but you have to take intro to theology. <clears throat> and you had to take one other religious class to graduate. Everybody had to take two. And I was fascinated by my intro to theology class, and it, it filled a space that I was asking questions about because, you know, I grew up kind of re religiously mixed. I like to say I'm a religious mutt <clears throat> because I got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. My, my dad was raised Methodist and Southern Baptist. His mom was a Methodist. His dad was a Southern Baptist or vice versa. I don't remember. But they, he grew up going to both. My mom was raised Presbyterian. So I would go to the Presbyterian church when we visited her, her parents. Uh, we went to Methodist church for a long time just cause, because occasionally we'd go to the Baptist church. So I heard, heard all kinds of different stuff. And then we got busy. I played soccer. My brother played soccer and baseball. And, you know, we, we started getting doing all that stuff. My parents, my mom was a baseball player or a softball player and a volleyball player. And so <clears throat> about the time I started junior high, my parents – really got back into fast pitch softball, um, like the the competitive leagues outside of school. And there were several teams in town. And so we would spend a lot of like our summers and stuff and weekends. We would, when we weren't, <laughs> when we weren't going and doing stuff at the ranch or the farm, we would go watch softball tournaments. So we were always bouncing around <clears throat> doing that kind of stuff. Anyway, I ended up there. Um, and uh, right before I graduated high school, like, a quarter of the way through my senior year, we got invited to go to a, a Lutheran church in Tomball, Texas, which is now like almost part of Houston, and it used to be out in the boonies. Like it used to be a 25-minute drive to get to Tomball, but now it's like all the same thing. Um, and so I got exposed to a variety of different religious Christian Protestant backgrounds. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I was really fascinated by that, so I switched my major to um, compare a uh, religious background with like a focus in comparative religions, um, with like a minor in philosophy and a minor in history, which you know that's a marketable, that's a very very marketable degree. I'm being extremely sarcastic right now. Um, only slightly more marketable than a theater or uh, an art degree, <laughs> but uh, you know. And shout out to all those theater people. You work your butts off. You do, but it takes a passion to do it. One of my best friends was a theater major. Um, so after that, um, I, I also got married my senior year, uh, halfway through my senior year in 99, um, to the woman that I had dated pretty much all through high school, was basically the first girl I ever dated with any kind of seriousness. Um, and uh, that second semester, and this is part of why I never got to know your wife, that senior year was super busy for me. Um, I commuted from Austin to Luling three days a week to finish up my last semester because my ex-wife um, was a year older than me and graduated a year before I did and uh, was working, working in Austin. And so, you know, we got married in December 99 and I kind of half moved in. And I would spend like three days a week. I drive in Monday night and I had set my classes up. So they were all Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I would drive in like Monday night and uh, crash at one of my buddy's places and uh, stay there three days and then come back. Um, and that's how I finished up my, my senior year. Um, and then I needed a job. <clears throat> and a buddy of mine was working for a big tech company. Uh, in the in the greater Austin area, I was like, "Hey, come check this out." And uh, I had to do the whole contractor thing, but they weren't hiring right then. And so I applied, and uh, they weren't hiring, so they needed somebody to watch a front desk. So I went and watched the front desk because there it was it was just some they needed a, a temporary secretary, and that job lasted about three months. 
Uh, then a data entry job came up, again, associated with the same big company, but it was a temp job and it lasted about 10 or 12 weeks. And I did a data entry job and I hated that. That was probably the single worst job I've ever had, but it was staring at a computer, entering names and numbers all day long for eight hours a day for like 12 weeks. Uh, and then they finally had a tech support class and I started doing phone tech support and I knew nothing about computers really at that point. Um, but that's when I learned, that's how I became kind of a techie. Uh, and I worked there for three years, um, started as a contractor, then got hired on with the company and I had applied to seminary <clears throat> because I thought, you know, I want to be a pastor. I thought that that was the calling that I had. Um, so that's when I found something I thought I wanted to do. Just, just to tag on that. Yeah. I, when I went to college, even though I didn't want to go, my intention was to go into Seminary as well. Yes, okay. that was my initial intention. Again, I think we probably both got the same like, oh, but then like the rest of it is so. Yeah, and, and, you can and talk I more will, about that. I, there, there will be a point where I will talk about my experience going through the whole seminary system, but that's a whole show. Yeah, that's a whole right. Um, so it got to the point where I had I had applied to seminary and I'd forgotten about it. Because it's a long process. It's it's not a quick process. I mean, so I was going to say, how long did it take before you to forget that you applied to seminary? Well, I had applied, and I hadn't heard anything back for six or seven months. Okay, that's a long time. All right, um, fair enough. And, you know, that uh, that's not just – you're not just applying to get into school. For Lutherans, you have to go through a whole, like, church process and interview process, mm -hmm. too. And I had done both. And I had the opportunity for a promotion at work. And that same day I got home and I had an acceptance letter in the mail. And so my ex-wife and I sat down and we talked because it was going to be a big move because I had applied to Gettysburg Seminary, which doesn't, which is still there, but is now part of a bigger seminary system. It merged with the Pittsburgh Seminary. And I have my own issues with that. But it's still there. There's still a seminary in Gettysburg. Um, <clears throat> it's just part of a larger organization. Um and, uh, you know, we talked it out. The economy was not going – the economy had tanked. This would have been about 2000 and, 2002. And my ex-wife at the time was working – she wanted to get into the hospitality industry. And her original goal was to, like, manage hotels and high-end hotels and do that kind of stuff. It's a good gig if you can and, get it. And it, it wasn't going anywhere. In fact, she was working in a call center booking stuff for people and had gotten a couple of promotions and didn't get laid off, but got pushed back because they had to like shrink back. Um, so we both decided we weren't going anywhere. And uh, if we were going to do it, we were going to do it. So I went to seminary and um, I spent five years going through seminary. It's normally a four year program, uh, but. But you're dumb and it took you five work, years. No, <laughs> no the, because of the way the finances and stuff yeah. worked. Um, I was trying not to borrow a lot of money. I ended up borrowing more money than I ever should have. But um, I was going to go part time the first two years mm -hmm. and then go full time. So it just it, took you an extra. It, yeah. So instead of doing a full load the first year, you know, I I had to make some up. So um, uh, and there's some other stuff that that happened with there. So I did three academic years and two years in the field. Um, actually doing pastoral work, uh, doing the whole minister work thing. And we'll take an episode. You have some great stories yeah, that we'll have um, to go I over. I also got to do – the single most rewarding thing I did in the entire thing was my chaplaincy rotation, Yeah. which was a 10-week rotation uh, working for a Level 4 trauma center as a chaplain. And a chaplain is not a minister. For those people who aren't religious, chaplains and pastors and priests and rabbis – Whereas pastors, priests, and rabbis can do things that chaplains do, and a lot of them do, a chaplain is not a specifically religious thing. In fact, yeah. there was someone who went through the chaplaincy program with me who was an atheist, hmm. because chaplaincy is very much about being with someone in a moment of crisis. Yeah. My my grandfather, uh, my dad's my dad's dad, um, who we'll talk about, he was big into camping and, uh -huh. and all that. He did a lot of stuff with things like YMCA and, and mm -hmm. all that. But but he was a chaplain in the Navy during World War II, and he went to the Pacific as a chaplain. Yeah. So he got trained to do all that same kind of 
Same and kind of stuff. I, I want to throw a caveat out here that uh, I am not going to talk about my ex-wife's medical stuff other than to say that she needed a medical procedure done <clears throat> in 2007 when I was waiting to be placed in a full-time church. Mm. So she was, and she had gone from being in the hospitality stuff to becoming a school teacher during this time. She, she went and got her master's degree and she was very successful, worked, worked her butt off to do all that <clears throat> while I was up there. At a, but a procedure needed to be done. But yeah, she needed some deal. major medical thing. Yeah. And she couldn't go back to school. She couldn't fulfill her school contract because of what needed to be done. Right. And I wasn't going to have work for six months or medical insurance. And I went, crap. And I went to the church. And I was like, really? You're going to leave me hanging? And they basically were like, yeah, pff, deal with it. Um, so I moved us back into the corporate world and moved us from... Indiana, where we were living in uh, Indiana, right at the bottom of Lake Michigan, in a beautiful town. If you ever get to go visit in the summer, summertime, not winter, <laughs> summertime, Laporte, Indiana. I was I was privileged enough to work at the church, the Lutheran Church in Laporte, Indiana. Um, gorgeous town, right on the you know there's beaches, all kinds of stuff on Lake Michigan in the summertime. It's horrible in the winter because they have like seasons there. It gets cold. They have ice. For we months, we have ice. It's end. for three days. It shuts the city down, and then it all turns into water and disappears. Yeah, and they have snow and cold, and winter is just wrong. I'll say that. As a good southern Texas boy, winter is bad. <clears throat> winter is when you should be golfing, right? You know, or camping or hiking. Yeah, that's, that's what winter's for here. You know, it's like 62 degrees, sunny. That's winter. That's winter, you know? Um, but anyway, so I moved us back across the country uh, because I figured I could get back on with that same big tech company because I still knew a lot of people who worked there. And in fact, I did. I had to come back in as a contractor. Um, and uh, actually, my, my ex ended up having the medical procedure done up north at a hospital that was up there and stayed with her parents for a little while, um, you know, a few months while that was done until we could get everybody moved down and we stayed and you know i moved out two weeks after i turned 18 and never went back home for more than like a week or a week and a half and i had to move in with my folks because everything fell apart and we're from a good southern family you do that you take care of it it's it's it, it, it we just did we made it work and i was lucky enough to get yeah you know, i did the big contractor thing and uh it was really kind of neat because one of the employees one of the big manager types uh walked in and where they're doing the big interview where we're all sitting around and i had to do the same test you had to do and everything and i didn't figure they'd recognize me because we weren't real good friends i mean we had known each other before but it had been five years right um and uh was talking giving a speech and looked around the room and stopped and went hey billy looked over at the contractor people and said hire him and then went right back into his spiel <laughs> and and you know the guy <clears throat> you you've met him you, you i'll tell you I'll, tell me later off air. <clears throat> and so then i i took the test and you know i did the thing and i walked in and i go well i guess i should probably hire you but let's talk and i did go through the full interview process and everything and i was a contractor for about six months and then i got hired on with the big tech company and um i did the uh, worked my way up um, into a specialty group. We actually worked That's together. That's where we met, yeah. Um, we, were, we did a lot of stuff, but we focused on network-type things, yeah. like you know routers and that kind of stuff, email, a lot of that, that Internet stuff when people were still figuring it out. Um, this would have been about between uh, 07 and 09, that right? And I think right. you and I started working together directly in 08. Because we worked together for about a year. That sounds I, right. Before yeah. I moved on. That sounds right. And my graduate degree actually helped me get the training job because I got into the training gig in about 2009, and I, I got a chance to do a lot of that stuff early on because I had a background in public speaking, a background in modifying material for other groups, and a lot of that stuff I learned how to do in seminary, and through churches I was able to apply at work, and I was also comfortable talking in front of people. <clears throat> because nothing nothing will show you how to be a better public speaker than trying to preach at church and having the little 
lovely, wonderful, blue-haired old ladies come up and tell you how horrible you did <laughs> and everything you did wrong. <clears throat> They're the best critiquers ever because they just don't care. They're like, not long enough. That didn't work. Your analogy sucked. You know. <laughs> Hang on, um, taking notes. Hang on, let me yeah, write yeah. that down. <laughs> um, so I did that, and uh, uh, and I've been, you know, I've been doing that job ever since, and it's been a fun job. I, I like I like teaching people. I like interacting with people. I like engaging with people. And that's I think uh, that's sort of what the idea of this is going to be is. Yeah. We spend a lot of time talking to people and learning about things and, and teaching people. And, and we've sort of come to the point of, I, I have thoughts and questions and, and well, ideas I was say, and we want to get answers to those. Even though you didn't do the college thing, you like learning. You're, you're, yes. you're interested in stuff. You want to dig. But you were burnt out. I, I think I, there's, there's a lot of things. And, and, we'll, and we'll get into we'll get that, into on, that. The, on the next one. But I, um, I think the, the idea here is that... that you know, we have similar yet very different backgrounds, um, and we both do the same thing. And really what the idea here is we we have questions that can be uncomfortable questions. Yeah. Um, you know, and we'll get into those. And we don't, but, but the idea that we're approaching this from is there, there's a, a, sort of the, the, the teacher thing. There's no such thing as a bad question. Yeah. You know, I know. Obviously, that you could ask a question in malice. I mean, there's a way. Yeah, to, you, you to, can to... be malicious about it, but if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah, and so the yeah. idea that we're going to approach this from is, you know, we'll talk more about where our backgrounds and our points of view comes from. But what is it that we're trying to figure out, and how can who can we talk to? And questioning some of our assumptions and things yeah. that we were taught, and just just took it face value. Um, but getting back to like my background, um. I've got two kids, just mm -hmm. like you. However, my kids are 10 years apart, almost to the day. They're five days apart. They're, they're 10 years and five days apart. Um, uh, and my oldest son uh, is, is wonderful. He's 18 now. Uh, but, and we, we'll talk about this some, he's extremely high-functioning autistic. Uh, and uh, I asked him, and he's okay with me talking about it. Um, and it took us a while. He's so smart and so high functioning. It took us a while to get him properly diagnosed. Um, and, uh, you know, I could talk, uh, we could do a whole show on some of the challenges of raising uh, a, a neuro atypical child. And for those who aren't out there and might think I'm making something up or trying to be offensive, neurotypical and neuro atypical are terms the therapists and the psychologists use to help us communicate. Uh, but kind of on your like your uh, aphantasia thing, I had a epiphany moment with my oldest son, trying to get him to eat, trying to get him to eat foods, and I was trying to get him to eat flavors I knew he liked, right? But he wouldn't eat it, um, and it'd be like pasta with a chicken sauce, like the say the Lipton chicken pasta meal yeah, yeah. with the noodles. He'd eat that. But if I tried to give him the rice version of it, wouldn't touch it. And it wasn't until I began to understand that texture was a problem for him. And like the like he didn't want to put on jeans for a long time because he didn't like the way it touched his skin mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. I had to realize he wasn't being obstinate. He was being bothered by something, mm -hmm. which is very, very. But for someone who's not that way. Yes. It was very hard, and it caused a lot of like arguments and, and, and fights and, and unnecessary discipline for him because I thought he was misbehaving, and you know that was a struggle until we figured all that out. Um, and it's fascinating. And part of why we didn't realize because he's so super smart. Like I mean, he was talking at like 18 months old, reading really early. I mean, brilliant um, as far as his his like cognitive abilities go. Um, but my younger son is. Um, uh, my younger son, yeah, is, um, completely neurotypical, like right dead center in the middle. And so if we'd had them in the reverse order, like if my youngest son had come first and then we had my oldest son, I think we would have, we would have figured it out earlier. Mm, yeah. And I'll tell you what it is, is my older son didn't know what to do with an action figure. Like he couldn't play imaginatively. Hmm. Um, whereas my youngest son, like... He-Man is attacking Godzilla, and Voltron is coming in to mm -hmm. save them, and the big, giant, epic things, right? Um, 
Whereas my older son wanted toys where he could build with um, and almost had a photographic memory early on. Like, uh, I remember he came down at like three and a half to visit my parents and built a scale model of the home we were living in out of Lincoln Logs from yeah. memory, you know, so very spatially aware. Um, you know, he liked to, he'd see an airplane, so he'd cut and build one out of foam board and it'd fly just freehand. So a lot of spatial stuff. Um, um, and we found ways to connect and we found ways to do that, but there's been a lot of challenges. Um, I'm also a single parent. I mentioned, you know, I went through a very long, uh, divorce and custody, uh, thing and I have my kids the majority of the time. And that's as far as I will get into that. Uh, my ex-wife is a wonderful person. Um, and she... And that's all we're going to say about that. Well, she's just... a wonderful person, and she's a wonderful mother. And that's all we're going to say about it. We're just going right? to leave that. Not, yeah, it doesn't need to... But I'm just not going to talk about it. So if you all have questions, don't ask. I won't talk about it because of privacy reasons. Absolutely. So... Um, Go ahead. Yeah. So, that, so we're, we're gonna go ahead and, and that's and, me. Yeah. Let's 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 go ahead and wrap this one up. Okay. Um, and then I think I think our next one, uh, we're gonna get into some of the things that we're interested in. Yeah. And I'm just gonna tease the word ancient civilizations, and we'll UFOs. get in we'll get into that. Aliens. Aliens, UFO, UFOs, cryptid. ancient civilizations, cooking, all you sorts know, of stuff. Political reform. Political reform. Uh, change the education system. Yeah. Uh, repairing the welfare system, um, social social issues. Uh, why my friends think that like I'm a conservative, but or a liberal, depending on what it is we're talking about, yeah, right? Yeah. So we're um, going to get into some some all kinds of other messy stuff. topics, messy topics, messy topics, and and things and let's... that you're afraid to ask questions about. And and the way that we're going to approach this is, we're asking because we don't know. Yes, we're we're trying to find out. We're we're asking because because and, and and I think the big thing is the only things that we are experts in we're not going to be talking about. Well, uh, I mean, uh, the, te the technical I, I, as a, as a as a business. Yeah, you, you we're have... not going to talk about like the tech stuff we do for a living. And whereas you know, I'm not an expert. We may dive into some of the religious stuff. Yeah, and I'm not an expert, but, but I know a, a lot background. more, and I actually have a background in it. I I, I actually have a actual. Like but I think I think the it, assumption so. that we um, should be we should be laying on this is we don't know we don't know anything that we're talking about. That's we're, why we're, we're a couple of, we're a couple of we're a couple of idiots who are asking questions and we want to find out more. So we want to find people to talk to who are experts in the field and ask them questions. So, so. that's us. I'm Bill. I'm Daniel. And it's nice to meet y'all. <laughs>